If you have your Bibles with you, you can go ahead and open up to Matthew chapter 24. So uh, that is Matthew 24. So we're going to be continuing in this line of thinking, this line of discussion that we've been on the last several weeks, talking about the end times, talking about the end of the world, talking about heaven, talking about Christ's second coming. We've been looking at what heaven is going to accomplish on Sunday mornings, how the the problems that we have right now, whether it be the problems with our individual sins that we talked about last week, the problems with the brokenness in the world that we talked about this morning, and the next week we're going to talk about some of the brokenness within God's creation itself, and how heaven is going to be a solution to all of these things, that in heaven God's going to bring renewal to all of those problems that we have, but it, it's bigger than that because of our calling to bring some of heaven to earth. And we've been going through that on Sunday mornings, and then we've been talking about the coming of Christ on Sunday nights as well. So we're going to continue talking about that tonight. So in our discussions about heaven, in our discussions about Christ's second coming, we've focused in on the fact that we don't know when that day is going to come. This morning in particular, we talked about that now but not yet aspect of the kingdom of God, that we're a part of God's kingdom. God's kingdom is here, but yet it's there. God's kingdom is here, but it's not fully here, that we await for heaven the fullness of the kingdom when all of these things provided by the kingdom of God are going to be fully Accomplished. We're in a place without sin, without death, without problems, where all things have been renewed. And that is Jesus' actual line of thinking, kind of what we've been talking about. And Jesus goes and talks about this in Matthew chapter 24 and Matthew chapter 25. He begins at the beginning of chapter 24 with discussing about the destruction of Jerusalem. And then following the destruction of Jerusalem, he talks like we did last night in Paul's letter to the Thessalonians about how when that day, the day of Christ's return, the day when the world will end, Jesus says of that day and hour, no one knows. Jesus, while he was on earth, didn't even know when that day was going to be. And so in essence, like we talked about last week, like Paul says in several of his letters, Jesus' point is we must always be prepared for that coming. And so that's what moves him into Matthew 25, where he begins by telling two parables of how we are to be prepared for his coming. How we as his people, as his disciples, as his servants are to live in between. How we are to live between Christ's first coming and his second coming coming and following those two parables he ends Matthew chapter 25 with the discussion of the judgment when this kingdom finally comes to its fullness when Christ returns in this world as we know it ends how is that going to happen how are we going to be judged how is it going to be determined who gets to go and enter in to the fullness of this kingdom get to go and to reign with Christ and dwell with God and who is cast out of the kingdom, and that's how Jesus ends Matthew 25. And so tonight I want us to focus in on the second parable, the second story that Jesus tells describing the coming of this kingdom, and that is the parable of the talents. How are we to live in between? You know, I, I actually saw from a, a another uh, church a, a while back a, a preacher that I I know, had, had done a series called The In-Between. And, and I really liked the, the image that they, they put up. You can't see this, this bracelet that I'm, I'm wearing, but this bracelet has symbols on it that describes the gospel. It has an arrow pointing down, and that means that Jesus came. Followed by a cross, Jesus died. Then it has a picture of a tomb, Jesus rose again. And then it has an arrow pointing up, saying that Jesus ascended. And an arrow pointing back down again, telling us that he's coming once again. Jesus came, he died, he rose, he ascended, but he's coming back. And so the the background image of the series that, that he did highlighted the first and the last arrow. And then in between those two arrows, it said the in between. How do we live in the in 
between? How do we live in between Jesus' first coming and second coming? Because he did come. He did come. He issued in this kingdom, but he's coming back to bring the fullness of the kingdom. How are we to live in this in between? And these are what these two stories in Matthew 25 are meant to tell us. And so I want to begin, and I just want to read this parable. So if you have your Bibles, follow along with me. Matthew chapter 25, <coughs> beginning in verse 14. Jesus says, for it, talking about the kingdom, for it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went on his way. He who had received the five talents went at once and traded with them, and he made five talents more. So also he who had the two talents made two talents more. But he who had, dug, who had received the one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. Now after a long time, the master of these servants came and settled accounts with them. And he, and he who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents. Here I have made five talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And he also, who had the two talents, came forward saying, Master, you delivered to me two talents. Here I have made two talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. He also, who had received the one talent, came forward saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here, have what is yours." But his master answered him, You wicked and slothful servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I scattered no seed. Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and at my coming I should have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the one who has the ten talents. For to everyone who has will more be given, and he will have an abundance." But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So this is a popular parable. It's a parable that probably all of us have heard preached many times in many uh, different ways. We use this parable to talk about uh, everything from our uh, talents and abilities to, to the gifts that God has blessed us with, to, to our money, to all kinds of different things this parable is used to, to talk about. But uh, tonight, I, I kind of want to talk about this parable in a little different way than maybe you've heard it presented before. Because I, I think sometimes we have tried to allegorize this parable so much and talk about all the different things in our life that God has entrusted us and, and how we are to, to use those. And those are all good and those are all uh, right. But I, I wonder sometimes if we've tried to allegorize this parable so much that we've missed the point that we've missed the main foundational point that all of this allegorization is built upon, the main thing that Jesus was trying to get across to his followers. Because you see, we, we must remember that Jesus tells this parable in the midst of discussion about the kingdom. That, that's where Matthew places it. He, Jesus tells this in the middle of all this discussion about his second coming, about the judgment, about the fullness of of the kingdom and how are we supposed to live now in anticipation for that day of the coming kingdom and so in doing that he tells this parable where i think it's obvious to most of us where jesus is the master he he has come he has brought his kingdom and he has left and we're waiting for him to return again to bring in the fullness of the kingdom but why the while the master is away 
In this story, he has entrusted his servants with his property. That, that's important. Jesus does not say that he entrusted them with their property, with someone else's property, but the master takes his own property and he entrusts it with his servants. Each according to their ability. One servant received, not each servant received the same amount of talents, each according to their abilities. And then he goes on and he discusses how the servants use this. But I, I want us to understand truly how much value the master leaves with his servants. Because sometimes we look at, okay, so the, the master leaves, he entrusts things with his servant. To one uh, servant he gives five talents, to another two, to another uh, one. And then we go and start allegorizing, well, what are the different things that these talents can mean? Well, they can be, mean this, they can mean this, they can mean this. But we miss the value that the master leaves with his servant. So a talent was about 20 years wages for an average worker. So for an average worker, they would have to work 20 years and all the money that they made that entire 20 years would equal to one talent. And so he gives 20 years worth of wages. That, that's how much the smallest amount that he gives there and it goes up from there to three and to, to five and that's a lot of money. That is a lot of value. Let, let me put it in a perspective for you today. And so if, if we took the number 50,000 as the average worker's wage, I know that's more than the average household income in the United States, but it makes the numbers add up a lot easier to do it that way. So if, if we took $50,000, then one talent would be worth $1 million. That means to the least servant, the master entrusted him with a million dollars. And to the greatest servant, the master entrusted him with five million dollars for safekeeping while he's away. That is not a little bit amount of money. This is not just some little thing that the master says, here, uh, I, I trust you with this. He trusts them with something with a lot of value. And he expects the servants to do something with the valuable thing that he has given it to him. The, the master doesn't give the servants all this valuable money just for them to hold on for safekeeping, but he expects them to do something with it. I, I think that's what Jesus means when he has the, the final servant say to the master, I know that you reap where you have not sown. You expect to gather things where you have not put in the work. In, in other words, you have given us this valuable thing. You've given us your money and you expect to come back and receive more than what you left to receive money where you have not worked, but we have gone to work for you. And so we're presenting this back to you. That's what the master expected. And so with the first two servants who did that, even though they didn't receive as much money when the master left, they weren't expected to double, they weren't expected to get as much while he was gone, but the fact that they took it and they used it the master says, enter in to the joy of your master. You are a good and a faithful servant. But to the last servant, who did not use the money, who did not use the value that was left, he is kicked out into the place where the master says there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. He didn't use what God had entrusted him with. And you see, when Jesus left, he entrusted something of great value with us. He entrusted something of the most value with us as his people. And that is his kingdom. Jesus left and entrusted his kingdom, entrusted his church to his followers. Yes, God has given us a lot of things. Yes, God has entrusted us with all kinds of things and he expects us to use everything for his glory, whether that be our talents or that be our money or that be our time or anything like that. But in the context here in Matthew, Jesus is focused on the kingdom. That's the most valuable thing that God has left to us, his kingdom. And it's so valuable. It's worth a lot more than the $5 million that's left with the greatest servant. 
First off, it's valuable because do you realize what it took to bring about this kingdom? The kingdom that you and I are a part of was established through the sacrifice of blood. It took God Himself coming to earth as a man. It took Jesus Christ being beaten and scourged and nailed to a Roman cross to establish this kingdom. This kingdom is of great value. The church is also of great value because it's the only way to reign in heaven with Christ. That's what we've been talking about on on Sunday mornings, that in, in heaven all of these problems are going to be fixed. How do we get there? We must be a part of the kingdom. Jesus says that when this day of judgment comes to his followers, we're going to be told good, that we are good and we are faithful servants, and we're going to be told to enter into the kingdom. Well, how are we going to be told by God to enter into the kingdom? Well, it's because we were already part of the kingdom. We were already a citizen of that kingdom. That's what we talked about last week. Where is our citizenship? Is our citizenship on earth more important to us than our citizenship in heaven? Because only our citizenship in heaven allows us to enter in to that kingdom. This kingdom is of more value than we could ever imagine. It was bought with the blood of Christ. It's the kingdom that allows us to reign and dwell with God, and it has been entrusted to us. We have been given this thing of great value, just like these servants were, how are we going to use it? Are we going to be like the first two servants and put God's kingdom to work? Are we going to actually use it? Are we going to try to multiply God's kingdom so Christ comes back and receives more than what He left? Or or are we going to be like the third servant and go and bury it because we're afraid to go out and use it? Are we going to bury it and not put it to work? Just let the kingdom kind of sit there and gather dust and say, well, God, you received the same thing that you left. That's not what Jesus wants. The master didn't want to return to receive the same value that he left. He wanted to return to receive something more valuable. He wanted to return and get something that had been put to work. And when Christ comes back for his kingdom, he doesn't want to come back and receive the same thing that he left. He wants to come back and receive something that we have put to work and grown. Are we going to use the kingdom? You you may think that this is kind of a a harsh statement, but I, I believe it's true. I believe that the two most unused things in the United States are the kingdom of God and a treadmill. I'm not sure if you've noticed, but a treadmill seems to have a set life cycle in the United States. We go and we buy the treadmill with expectations that we're actually going to use it because we want to get in shape, we want to be healthier. So normally we buy it around this time of year. It's a Christmas gift from someone or it's We've made a New Year's resolution that we're going to be healthier, we're going to lose weight, whatever it's going to be. So we buy that treadmill. And we use the treadmill for a month, maybe two months, and then we we slowly start using it less. And we were using it five times a week, and now we're using it three times a week. And now, if we're lucky, we're using it one time a week, and then all of a sudden it becomes the family coat rack. And we just start hanging our, our coats on it, and there it sits for a... These are scientific numbers here. It sits there for five years, and then finally it gets put in a garage sale and sold for a fourth of the price that we actually paid for it. I'm not sure if I've ever been to a garage sale that didn't have a five-year-old treadmill, at least, at it. Every garage sale, it's not a garage sale if it doesn't have a treadmill that was bought and used for a couple months and then had a, a, then used as a coat rack. You know, you, you never see a treadmill at a garage sale that's really ever used. Like, like you don't really ever, at least I haven't, seen one that's, you can tell, oh, this treadmill put a, they put a lot of use into it, and now it's selling it. They always look brand new, because they were used for a month and then became a very, very expensive coat rack. The kingdom, I feel like, is kind of like that. We, we don't use the kingdom like we even, like we should, or even like we expected to. We become a part of of the kingdom at the very beginning when we first became a Christian, when we first became a part of the church, and we get excited, right? 
We're excited about everything that we can do. We want to be a part of everything. We want to see the kingdom grow. We want to do all this. But after time, that, that, that excitement and that usage starts getting less and less and less and less. And then the kingdom just kind of becomes our coat rack becomes a thing that we, we, we go to on, on Sundays, at may, maybe both times. We, we go to on, on Wednesdays, and we, we, we do some fellowship stuff. We, we, we give some money here and there, and we do, we do a little bit, but we, we're not really putting the kingdom to use. Do you understand how valuable the kingdom is? The kingdom was bought with the blood of Christ. The kingdom is the way that you and the rest of the world can get access to God. Why don't we put the kingdom to use? As I said, when Christ comes back, he wants to find a kingdom that has grown, a kingdom that has been put to use, not a kingdom that has been buried in the ground. And we bury the kingdom when we fail to live for the kingdom when we fail to spread the kingdom. But I think the biggest way that we bury the kingdom is when we make the kingdom all about ourselves. You see, if, if the kingdom becomes all about me, what, what can I get out of the kingdom? What can I get from God? What can I get from the church? What can I get from worship? When it's all about me, 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 the kingdom is not being put to you. The kingdom's not put to use by what it does for us. The kingdom's put to use by how we use it in the lives of other people, including those within the kingdom. Because when we make the effort that we're going to be like the first two servants, we're going to put this thing of great value to use, we're going to put the kingdom to use, it starts within the walls of the kingdom. We begin putting the kingdom to use by the way that we interact with our fellow Christians, with our fellow, fellow citizens within the kingdom. Because a lot of times when we think of growth, when we think of putting something to use, when we think of this idea of Christ coming back and wants to see have the kingdom grown, the kingdom having been put to use, that's not necessarily numerical numbers. That, that's not, that, that, that may be part of it, but that's, that's not necessarily what it means to put the kingdom to use. We can put the kingdom to use by making the kingdom stronger. You can put the kingdom to use by the way we interact with one another. When the kingdom becomes like the family it was intended to be we strengthen one another and the kingdom grows you don't see it numerically but you see it spiritually you see it within the lives of those who make up the kingdom because the world is a place that is easy to break us down and it will break us down individually but it can't break us down as a group it can't break us down as a group that is found in Christ, are we going to use the kingdom? But it could also be a numerical thing. Yeah, we, we, we want to make the kingdom stronger. We want to put the, the kingdom to use, but we also want to extend the walls of the kingdom. We want the kingdom to include as many people as we possibly can. And so that causes us to have to go outside of the walls of the kingdom to find those who are not a part of it and bring them in to this kingdom, to bring them in to the church that we understand has so much value. Why, how can we understand how great a value the church has and that not compel us to go and want to share that value with everybody that we come across? Let, let's go back to the money illustration that Jesus uses here. If, if we know that being a part of the kingdom, everyone received $5 million. Let's say that we, we all, as soon as you come up out of the water, $5 million appears in your bank account. Wouldn't you go and tell everybody that, hey, if you come and you do this, $5 million appears in your bank account. I can't imagine anyone saying, no, I don't want to tell anybody about it. I don't want to tell anybody about this. No, you, you would find everyone you could possibly tell and say, hey, did you realize if you do this, you can get $5 million? Well, we have something that is of so much greater value than money. And yet we don't want to share it with people. We want to keep it to ourselves. And, there, and there's a lot of reasons for that that we're not going to get into tonight, but a lot of times we just we want to keep it to, to ourselves. So sometimes it's because we're too afraid to go out and use the, the kingdom to try to extend the walls of the kingdom. Uh, sometimes we get comfortable in the way that things are, and if we, we start uh, changing 
things to extend the walls of, of the kingdom. Well, now I'm, I'm no longer comfortable, and I don't like that. Do you see the phrasing there? I don't like that. We get back to the I. We get back to making the kingdom about myself. What can the kingdom give to me? And that's the wrong attitude. It's not about what the kingdom can give to me. It's what can I give to the kingdom. How can I use the kingdom? The last servant was the one who said, how can this money benefit me? Well, if I go out and I try to double it, I could lose it, and that will hurt me, so I'm just going to bury it. Versus the other two said, no, it's not about me. It's how can I use what my master has given me? I'm going to go out and I'm going to take the risk of trying to double the money. You see, it took risk to try to do that. And the first two said, it's not about me, so I'm not going to be afraid of the risk. I'm going to go out and double it. But when we, get, when we get comfortable again, it becomes all about us. It's not what can I give to the kingdom, it's what can the kingdom give to me. And so we, we kind of get frozen in, in place. And I don't, well, if we, if we change uh, uh, this, I'm, I'm not going to like that. Yeah, it may help us to extend the, the kingdom, but I don't want to uh, do that. Or if we get some people that are like, like, like this, they may want to change things up a, a little bit. And I just wouldn't be comfortable there. Again, we're not talking about changes that go against what God has, has regulated, but talking about our, our preferences. And it becomes about us. It becomes about my preference, my opinion, rather than how can I put the kingdom to use? Am I going to overcome my, my fears? Am I going to overcome my uh, opinions? Am I going to overcome the, the groups of, of people that I, I don't like or that I have? I mean, that's, let's be honest, we're, we're, we're humans. And if, if you remember, we talked this morning about, j- just briefly, about the, the Samaritans and how Jesus, in talking about the Samaritans, said, yeah, you Jews hate this group more than anybody else. You hate them because the Samaritans were considered as half-breeds. They were half-Jews, half-Gentiles, which to the Jews were worse than being just Gentiles. I mean, it was, it was, a, it was a racial thing. It's you're, you're part us, you're, you're part them. You might as well either be fully Gentile or fully Jew, but the fact that you're both, we don't like that. And the Jews also didn't like their religious beliefs. The, the Samaritans worshipped at a different place than the Jews did. And they, they couldn't stand them. But when Jesus told the parable of the Good Samaritan, his point was the love that you are to show for people extends across any boundary. It breaks down any wall that you or your society has put up. And we put up those walls. Sometimes we don't realize we've put up the walls, but, but, but we do. Uh, that's a part of us living in, in a sinful world. As humans, we, we have a tendency to want to put up walls between people that are different than us. But Jesus says the love of the kingdom is, extends past those walls and tries to bring everybody into the kingdom. Are we using the kingdom? It's so valuable. And I want to draw your attention to one last thing in this parable, and that is that Jesus, when the, the master leaves and he, he's giving these talents to his servants, uh, one got five, the other three, the other one, all according to their ability, is what Jesus says. They weren't all entrusted with the same amount. The kingdom of God is of the greatest value of anything. But not all of us are going to be able to use the kingdom in the same way. Not, not every single uh, one of us is going uh, to be able to bring 100 people into the kingdom. Not, not every one of us is going to be able to baptize 100 people. Not, not every one of us has been given the, the, the gift of, of teaching or, or of preaching. Not every one of us have, has been given the gift of, of encouragement. We've all... Uh, we, Each of us are different, and so we're not going to be able to use the kingdom in the exact same way. And so in the way that that we view things, not all of us are going to be as successful in using the kingdom as as others. But the point that Jesus is making is those kind of things that we want to kind of tally up, okay, well, you've done all this for the kingdom, and I've done all this, who's better, who's done more? The point that Jesus is making is that all that talk is worthless, What matters is are you using the kingdom? Are you using what God has entrusted to you? A lot of times we we want to say, well, I can't do that, so I'm of no use for the kingdom. And Jesus says that's absurd. That's not the way we should be thinking. 
Jesus says each one of us can put the kingdom to use in, in different ways, in different amounts of quote-unquote success in the way that we would use it. But Jesus says that, that doesn't matter as long as you're putting the kingdom to work. Are you going to use the most valuable thing that could ever be given to us? Something that was bought with the blood of Christ, the, the kingdom that allows us to be with God and reign with God. Are you going to put what God has entrusted to you to work? Are you going to grow and strengthen the kingdom by the way that you reach out and you interact with one another? Are you going to try to spread the kingdom? Are you going to overcome your, your fears of evangelism? Are you going to overcome your, your fears related to comfort? Are you going to overcome your fears based on people and groups that you put up walls between you and say, you know what, I'm going to put God's kingdom to work because it's not about me. It's not about what I like. It's not about the kind of people that I like. It's not about those kind of things. It's about the kingdom. It's about God. I've been given the most valuable thing in the world, and so I am going to use it. Or are you going to put the kingdom to work? Let's pray. Dear Lord, again, we just want to we, we can't thank you enough for what you have given to us. We can't thank you enough for the value of the kingdom that you have placed us in. And, and our prayer is that we, we won't get stuck where we are. We, we've been talking a lot about the coming of your kingdom. We've been talking a lot about, about heaven. And, and the point is sometimes we can get stuck where we are. We can get focused on the here and now rather than the future. And we pray that when we do that, you will spur us up, that you will help us to encourage one another, that you through your spirit will strengthen us and empower us to want to go out into the world and put your kingdom to use, to spread the walls of your kingdom to include as many as it possibly can and to strengthen and uplift those who are already a part of the kingdom. That, that is our prayer, that, that we won't, be like the servant who buried the kingdom, that we won't let this, this kingdom gather dust and become a coat rack, but that we will actually put your kingdom to work so that when you return, you will find a return on the investment that you've entrusted with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's rise up.